Hello, welcome to the LA Institute video series. My name is Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz. And on this video, we're gonna talk about using super gingival principles to do minimally invasive porcelain veneer preparations. Basic tooth preparation for porcelain veneers is so different between uh, different educators between different institutes and it's changed, it really has changed quite dramatically over, over, over time. Um, the original preparation, the, 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 you know, when porcelain veneers first came into, into dentistry, we were prepping very, very little and then some, some uh, institutes and some um, dental organizations became very, very, um, very much about achieving the perfection in regards in giving the laboratory a lot of space and then they became increasingly more aggressive on the preparation. Right here on the screen you can see two very dramatic different you know approaches to preparation. The one in the right is is uh, out of an article from from a well-known educator who suggests that that in order to achieve excellent results we want to give the laboratory a lot of space and uh, and this is a common approach in dentistry and also you know hiding the margins below the gum so you see that the preparations are aggressive and subgingival the approach on the left is the the way uh, you know the LA Institute and, and myself have been doing it for 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 20 years and uh, and that is keeping the margins above the gums and preserving as much of the natural tooth as possible so the objectives of this video is to really you know make it make it make a statement as, as to why is it important to stay super gingival and to be minimally invasive by, by preparing porcelain veneers and of course uh, also, we want to talk about how can we achieve that? What are the steps necessary to, to, to achieve, you know, to get the, the best possible results while staying super gingival and minimally invasive? Uh, the consequences of aggressive veneer preparation are, are several. And these two patients right here, they, they were told they were going to have um, porcelain veneers. And as you can see, the preparations are very aggressive and um, subgingival in many in many of the situations. And what are the what are the consequences of this? First of all, when the patient saw this this th their teeth, when they actually saw their teeth, they were very upset. And they tell me both patients told me that when they saw how much of their teeth were ground away, they one of them said, "My heart felt when they saw this." I mean, I mean, we any of us will feel very offended and hurt if we see our teeth being ground away this aggressively. Um, so that's one very negative effect. It scares patients and makes patients very unhappy. Uh, another, if we go subgingival, uh, as you can see on the picture, there's a few teeth that are, have subgingival margins and those teeth, the day of the cementation, that's going to be difficult because you know when you're, when you're trying to bond and you need perfect isolation and absolute no bleeding, uh, when you have subgingival margins and the patient has been on provisionals for a period of time, those are going to be hard to, to bond. It's going to be hard to control the bleeding and, and it's going, it's, it leads to complications and it leads to sometimes some, some undesirable results. Uh, another big disadvantage, as we all know, is that if, if when we remove all the enamel, we have lost the best substrate to bond to. So both of those cases on the screen are cases where we're bonding to dentin. And, and, and bonding to dentin has limitations. It leads to increased post-op sensitivity. It leads to increased chances, of course, of root, future root canals. And of course, it leads to also decreased uh, longevity on the adhesion. And that in turn leads to less durable results. So, I mean, there's all kinds of uh, uh, reasons why this approach, which is very popular, is not very good, and uh, and that's you know that's what we we want to minimize, and we see this all the time. This is just one of endless articles that I receive in my office on on journals and pseudo journals, where uh, colleagues you know suggest that we prep aggressively because we they want to use certain materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the, the bottom line is cases like this, um, you know, 
the reason why this teeth were prepared uh, incorrectly is because of improper diagnosis. So this particular case, the, the article tells us that our colleague here decided to use uh, a material called Empress, which is a, a, you know, a very good material, but uh, it requires a little more space. Now, uh, if you see the situation, you will realize that this patient's teeth were retroclined and narrow. The patient, in fact, wanted fuller teeth. So if you, if you, if you imagine this in your mind's eye, it means the patient, the, those teeth need to be filled up. Th that means that there's space. So, so when, when our colleague says the Empress requires a one and a half millimeter reduction, it's actually an incorrect statement. In fact, um, it doesn't require, it require a, a minimum and a half of, uh, of reduction. It requires a minimum millimeter and a half of space. And if the case already has space, then even if we were to use a material like Empress, we would still need, did not need to, to reduce. For example, right there, you see this wax up in this, this study model. And as you can see, we decided that the two centrals need to be longer. So we're lengthening a millimeter and a half on the centrals. Even if we were using uh, material like Empress, uh, uh, we would not need to do any incisal edge reduction because we have the space. So really, that makes a big difference. It, but, but if we don't do proper diagnosis to begin with, we, we run the very serious risk of uh, you know, having poor results. So um, really, it is very important that we try to be as accurate as possible on our, in our preparations. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. And one of those ways is by proper diagnosis and the creation or the development of proper wax ups by a laboratory. But when we're talking about, um, you know, wax ups, we're not talking about just grabbing a, a set of models and sending them to a laboratory and say wax up. We're talking about doing appropriate smile design, doing appropriate um, you, know, inf it, you know, information to the laboratory, give the laboratory specific details or where we want the incisal edges, how much longer we want the teeth to be. So when the laboratory gives us a wax up, is is really a very accurate reproduction of what we want the final results to look like. And, and additionally to that, I, want, I like to use uh, wax ups. They're, they're like, they, I like to call, and some more colleagues like to call as well, uh, additive wax ups. That means that, that n not every single tooth is wax up fully. It means that certain parts of the teeth are going to be, um, you know, preserved and waxed because maybe they're already with the right contour. If you see the wax up on your screen, you will see the four, the four anterior teeth are fully waxed up. But the canines are barely touched. Just, just some minor changes on the incisal edges of the canine is sufficient. Now, what is that? That gives us a lot of information at the time of preparation. So one of the ways to, you know, the simplest way, maybe the least accurate way to prepare, is by looking at a wax up and, and observing the thickness of the wax and that will give us a, a, you know, a guideline, a mental guideline of the external outline of that final restoration. And that will tell us whether we need to prep a lot or prep very little. For example, if you see, again, if, again, if you see this wax up in your screen, the canines are, have no wax on top of them pretty much, which tells us that we need to do a full preparation on the canine versus the centrals and laterals, which we can see there's a pretty good thickness of, of wax in those teeth, that tells us that the preparation for those four teeth are very minimum. Maybe we just need to establish margins. So by using the wax up as a guide, we, it, it saves us from having to over prep the teeth. So using our mind's eye to, to think about where the final outline will be of the restoration and then prepping based on that is, is easier but less accurate. Now, if we want a, a more accurate way to do that, then we can physically put on the teeth that final external outline of our restoration or our final restoration and then prep for that from there. 
How will we do that? We use a technique called the mock-up. And this particular case was done like that. So what we did is, is before prepping, we use a silicone matrix of the of created from the wax app, which is what we are thinking that is going to be our final outline. And then before prepping, we seat that on the patient's mouth, let the material polymerize or, or firm up. And then from there, we can trim the margins. And from there, we start prepping. And we're going to do a pretty much, uh, uh, you know, we're going to use that for our depth of preparation. And we would pre prep an ideal prep from there. That makes it extremely accurate. And, um, and it makes it pretty simple to do. It's a little extra step, but it makes us incredibly accurate. Now, the problem with that is it doesn't work in every situation because in some cases you have uh, uh, patients that have a lot of crowding. And if you have a lot of crowding, it's going to be very difficult to, to, sit, to seat the silicone matrix. So this is used, this, this mock-up technique is used more, more on cases where, t where patients have basically no uh, you know no crowding that will be the simplest situation to use that the next technique which is also very accurate is using a silicon reduction matrix this reduction this silicon reduction matrix is made out of a wax up of course we, we make a a silicone a silicon um, uh, reproduction of the wax up then we cut it in the appropriate places and then it gives us the, you know, it gives us a visual uh, ability to see where the external outline is. So for example, if you're looking at the picture on the right, you will see that the two centrals, you know, have about a millimeter and a half of space. That tells me that I don't have to create, do any more reduction in size so that's reduction because I have enough space. And the other hand, if you look at the canines on the same picture, the canines basically don't have any space. That means that I have to do full reduction based on whatever amount of space I have decided that I want to give the laboratory. Of course, that depends also on what material we're using, restorative material. If you see in the other, the other direction on the picture on the left, you will see that the two centrals, one more time, appear to have sufficient space for the restorative material, the porcelain. And the other hand, if you look at the left lateral, you will see that the, clearly there is no space. That means that that left lateral needs to still have full reduction, same as the left canine. So do you see that the, so the reduction matrix gives us a visual confirmation on how much do we have to grind. So those, those really are the three different techniques that we can use. This particular case that you see in front of us is a case that we uh, that, that I did with a silicone reduction uh, preparation guide. And it was, you know, after doing a smile design together with the patient, we made decisions on how much, you know, uh, we made decisions on a wax up. A wax up was fabricated, a silicone was, fab silicone was created uh, from the wax up and then cut appropriately. And from there we can see that there's certain teeth that, that require, a, you know, no reduction whatsoever, and there's certain teeth that require uh, a additional reduction. So using the silicone matrix, I was able to do very accurate uh, re preparation. Definitely, all the, the entire preparation was all on enamel. Everything was kept super gingival, and as you can see, we can give our patients beautiful results without sacrificing their natural teeth. Preparations that are super gingival have many, many advantages, as you see on the screen. If we keep the margins just above the gum, when, I'm talk when I say super gingival with porcelain veneers, I mean almost to the gum level, but not touch the gum. So just ever so a slight super gingival. Um, the benefit of that is that when, when the day of the cementation, the margins are are, you know, the gums are healthy, there's no irritation on the tissues, um, and as you see, minimally invasive preparations. Whether we have a silicone matrix or a mock-up, uh, the numbers that I like to use are basically one millimeter in size, so space or reduction. 
So if, if we already have the space, then we do not need to do reduction. But if our, if, if our mock-up or our silicon matrix tells us that we don't have space, then we would have to reduce the one millimeter. If I'm going to be doing a reduction, then I like to do the reduction as accurately as possible. And I will use our uh, veneer preparation diamond from our LA Institute Burr kit. And uh, so the LA Institute preparation diamond is diamond 850014. That diamond in the middle of the cutting surface is one millimeter. So we're going to sink the diamond a full, the full thickness, the full millimeter in multiple places in the incisal edge. And after we do that, then we can join all the depth cuts together. And then we have a pretty accurate one millimeter reduction. I mean, 1.1. I mean, we're not talking about perfection. Humans are not perfect. But we're close to one millimeter if we do it like this. The next reduction is the cervical margin reduction. And this is pretty much something that we're going to do every time because I, we do want to establish margins. So even if, even, if the prepar even if we have space everywhere, we're still going to have to establish margins and we're still going to have to do a reduction in the cervical area of 0.4. Some people might be more conservative, might want to do 0.3. Usually if we do 0.3, 0 0.4, we're going to be mostly on, on enamel. Sometimes when we reduce in the cervical area, sometimes because the enamel in the cervical area is so thin, sometimes we do expose a little dentin, which is okay, because we want to have enough space for the porcelain to, to be able to, to fill the space and not have, we don't want to have like, you know, steps from our porcelain veneer to our tooth. So we do a 0.4 reduction. Uh, we use again the, the, the porcelain veneer preparation diamond from the LA Institute kit. The tip of that diamond is 0.8 of a millimeter. So what I do is I will sink that diamond in multiple places in the cervical area and I will sink halfway down. So uh, we will do multiple depth cuts and then after we do the depth cuts we will mark those with a pencil especially at the beginning when you're when you're getting your 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 eye used to preparing like this you can mark the depth cuts with a little pencil and then you will change the angulation of your diamond and and join all the depth cuts together and by the time you're done re re reducing that you will have your point for reduction then the middle of the tooth we're going to do a 0.6 reduction and we can do that by sinking the, the, the diamond a little bit more than halfway. And again, we're not, I'm not looking for the perfect reduction. We, we want to just be as close as possible uh, to the 0.6 in the middle of the tooth. And um, so, so we will sink it multiple times, then we will, we will mark it with a pencil, change the angulation of the diamond, join all the the reduction, the reduction uh, depth cuts uh, together and the, the purpose of the pencil is that by the time we erase all the pencil marks we, we know we will have achieved our full depth. Uh, after we do that then the next thing will be to sink the margins, to sink the, 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 those margins halfway interproximally. This type of preparation does not break contact. We are always going to leave the contacts there. We're just going to bring the preparation halfway into the contact, as you can see there on this picture to the, to the right. We will also make sure when we look from both sides, we will, we will want to make sure that the, the cable margin is not exposed. So if you look at the picture on the left, you will see that you can see a little bit of the cable margin, proximally. So what we're going to do is we're going to sink that, that margin uh, deeper into the contact point. The purpose of that is that when we look at the preparation from either mesial or distal, we cannot see the cable margin. After we've done that, you know, that preparation should look very much like you see on the screen, where the cable margin is not visible interproximally. The, the next step, since we're leaving the teeth in contact, 
the next step is to to just ever so slight perfect the interproximal surface by using a metal strip so what I like to do is I like to use a metal strip so that the metal strip will remove that little J margin that we might have left there during the the, the, the preparing the interproximal area also it will create a ever so slight separation so the laboratory can clearly see the margins and give us restorations that are properly adapted so just just ever so slight break the contact interproximally with a metal strip the final result should look very much like that there should be you know a 0 0.3 in the in the cervical 0 0.3 0 0.4 0 0.6 in the in the middle of the tooth uh, properly rounded incisal edge which would be kind of like our third plane and our incisal edge reduction is a butt margin there's no wrap around in this type of preparations wrap arounds are undesirable and they lead to to complications so let's take a quick look at uh, this in a live patient. So as you can see right here in this particular case, we are going to be doing a mock-up for this particular patient. We're, we're actually seeding the, the matrix, confirming that, that it fits. Then we will fill it with, uh, with bisacryl. And as you can see right here, I'm removing the matrix after the bisacryl set. Now I have the final outline the final outline of those porcelain veneers based on what, what, what our smile design told us that we wanted to do. So from here, from this outline, that's when I'm going to do my ideal reduction. So we're going to do the, the um, you know, the, the 0.4 cervical reduction and we do depth cuts. But again, remember, we, you know, we always want to make sure that, our, that we, we, we have 0.4 cervical reduction then uh, multiple depth cuts we're going to join them together you see that being done in the lateral then we're going to do it on the canine if you see some some irritation on the tissue is because the, the same day of the preparation i did a little a little gingivectomy uh, on on this case in order to have more symmetrical uh, you know um, gingival margins now you see me doing the incisal reduction and and so i'm sinking that that diamond a full one millimeter right on the middle of the, of the shaft of the the middle of the cutting surface of the diamond Do you see that and then i'm joining them all together now another th another feature that you see on my preparations is i use two hands and i think that's very important See, by using two hands, you see that, that, uh, that, uh, that, that my hand is holding both, you know, with, with the, the, the handpiece with both hands. That gives me a lot of accuracy, a lot of leverage, a lot of, a lot of control. After that, now you see me removing the, the mock-up after I did the depth cuts. And, 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 and you can see how the tooth is still shiny, which means that I... You know, after after depth cuts, I literally didn't even touch the tooth. Maybe maybe you see a little tiny mark here and there. That means that that I really had a lot of space. So you know, based on that, now the, the final thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I have the correct amount of incisal edge reduction. So I'm going to go through the whole preparation. Uh, I'm going to make sure that that, I'm, that my interproximal contacts are halfway interproximally then my margins are not visible interproximally, then my cervical margins are uh, basically the, the right depth and at the right place. And uh, I, you know, I will do that with, with, you know, the lateral as you see right there. And then, you know, then I will make sure that the incisal edge is just smooth. I don't, I'm not doing reduction. I'm just getting rid of whatever, you know, roughness might be there, whatever loose enamel might be there. I want it just to be nice and smooth. I'm doing the same thing now on the central. I'm making sure that the, inside, that the cervical reduction is appropriate. I'm going into approximately halfway into the tooth. You see me again using the two hands by you know by by grabbing the handpiece with two hands you truly become a little bit like a cat cam machine 
you have so much control, so much stability, it really makes a big difference. That's very important when I do porcelain preparation, porcelain veneer preparation. Well, I, I do that on every in every situation. And it keeps it gives me a lot a lot of control versus just holding the handpiece with one hand. With with any movement, I lose my my angle. Uh, now you see me just smoothing out, basically smoothing out that inside sledge, so there's so it's not irregular. I just want it to be smooth for the laboratory. And uh, one more time, check you know making sure that the interproximal uh, reduction is appropriate, that it's halfway into the contact point. And um, and and again, continue to use the two-handed technique. This you know really veneer preparation is actually quite simple that's the final result as you see there and and really um, you know very conservative preparations the the laterals were were um, you know pegged lateral so that way they look smaller if it was a full lateral you wouldn't see interproximal uh, broken contact so um, it makes a big it makes a big difference but the preparations are very conservative we're only doing six teeth and uh, and we, of course we we you know the patient was very happy because they they don't have much sensitivity it doesn't lead to a lot of problems. What are the benefits of this type of preparation? This the 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 you know the not breaking contacts, being staying super gingival, preserving enamel. Well, first of all, that the more tooth you have supporting your porcelain veneer, the better off you are. So I mean, there's no, there's no, there's just that's just logical. The more tooth is supporting your porcelain, the better off you are. The more enamel you have left to bond to, the better off you are. Because when we bond to enamel, we pretty much it's pretty much a, a permanent uh, 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 situation versus bonding to dentin. Um, of course, the more tooth we preserve, the healthier the tooth is going to be, and the happier our patients are going to be. Patients don't like to have their teeth ground away into little pegs. It, it, it bothers them, and I said it would bother me. Uh, the funny thing is, I, I treat a, a great number number of dentists, and dentists are the most peop the, the people are the most concerned about having their teeth ground out. They hate having their teeth ground down a lot, and and funny enough, sometimes we end up doing that to our patients. Another benefit of not breaking contacts is that that when we have our, our, you know, when we break contacts, we, we create, we give ourselves a problem because then all of a sudden the lingual surface of our veneers is exposed to the bite. And if, as the bite changes over the life of the patient, when the patient bites some porcelain, then, then they, they increase the chances of breaking. And if you see this case right here, the picture on the lower, the lower picture, is a case of a patient who has broken his porcelain veneers multiple times because his bite has changed. He bites on the lingual porcelain. He, he, he has extreme forces and, and breaks parts of the porcelain veneer and I've had, had to repair it multiple times. Now, these are not my porcelain veneers, but it just shows some of the mechanical disadvantages of breaking the contact intentionally. Now sometimes we have no choice. The, the contacts are already broken because either the patient has small teeth or, or, or truly there was a, a, a large part of the tooth missing. But if we can preserve it, you know, why would we create, give ourselves additional problems? So, so at the end, you know, you know the, the prepping conservatively leads to, to a lot of good things and prepping aggressively leads to a lot of problems. And, and a lot of a lot of times, and I tell you this because it's my personal experience. Uh, I, you know, when I wasn't quite as sophisticated as I am now, if I c you can say sophisticated, um, I, you know, every time I was going to prep, whether it was an only or a crown or anything else, I would just, in my mind, I would be thinking the amount of space that the laboratory needs, and I would just go and cut it, without thinking first if there was actually space to begin with. So I think that, that, that like in this example, it, it is a common thing that we do. Uh, so, so by using a proper diagnosis with a wax up, we can really give our patients what they need and what they want without having to destroy their natural teeth. So all the benefits of super gingival minimal invasive preparations. So, 
So uh, the step would be at this point would be that, you know, after we have the wax up, we are going to, you know, fabricate the silicon matrix, then we're going to provisionalize. The patient is going to be on provisionals for a week or two. We're going to make sure that the patient is happy. The patient will come in for a static check, like this case right here. This patient came in a week later after provisionals. She has her, provision, her, her temporaries or provisionals in place. We confirm that the patient loves the, the, the changes, the longer teeth, the, the slight movement of the midline, whatever we decide to do based on the smile design make sure the patient loves it and if the patient really likes that then we can duplicate that as the laboratory to to really duplicate as close as possible the midline position the the, uh, the incisal edge position and when we cement those restorations in the mouth it's going to be very consistent uh, you know the results so um, there are definitely situations where preparations are are complicated there's cases where the patient has a lot of caries. There's, there's of course, patients where they have lots of diastemas or situations where the patient has gen severe gingival asymmetries. Uh, uh, there's a number of complicated situations where, where you know, when we're doing prepara veneer preparations. But this video is not, the scope of this video does not include complicated veneer preparations. We will deal with that subject on a different video. So I encourage you to, if you're interested in looking at complicated or complications during veneer preparations, then uh, look at a library because you will find a video that covers such a subject. A in the meantime, I thank you for your attention and wish you the best.